Thanks so much, Kat. Um, and just conscious Kat's doing sort of double or triple duty today as, as of the creative mind and inspiration behind this series, as well as the person who's done all of the really hard work of putting it together. So today she's joining us as a speaker as well. So a big thank you to Kat. Um, so yes, yeah, sort of as Kat, Kat sort of said, we're, we're kind of stepping back from the bustle and the urban noise. And for those who've been madly running around the studio um, prepping for the whip show, to reflect on close observation of nature um, and falling back into its rhythms and reconnecting with ourselves. Um, my own prep for this is consisted of, of two things. There are one, long walks around the meadows around Oxford, um, where I live, um, on beautiful frosty days. But also reading Andrea Wolfe's magnificent book called The Magnificent Rebels, um, where she's writing about the German romantics at the end of the 18th century, kind of discovering the things that we're going to talk about today, this reflection on what the self is, um, the reflection, particularly through von Humboldt, of how nature is a unified thing, but also this really intimate connection between science and art and poetry. Um, and we have this wonderful opportunity today with three makers who are both deeply in love with nature and dedicated and curious to the understanding of self and of relationships that comes from being in tune with nature. And I realize if I don't move around a whole lot, the lights in the room, I'm gonna go off and on. So I hope that isn't too distracting. Anyhow, I'm just delighted to be today with these three very um, attuned, most and beautiful makers, Charlotte Karine, um, Lina Lefebvre and Katerina Knight um, to talk about how this plays in their own understanding of themselves and their work and in their work. So we're going to begin with a chance for each of our makers to just introduce herself a little and um, talk about her work. And while we're doing that, Kate is going to share some images of the work to give you a little bit of a sense um, of who you're meeting. Um, and Charlotte, let's begin with you um, telling us a bit about who you are um, and the work that you're making. Yeah, so um, my background is um, a BA in textiles at the University of Creative Arts in Farnham. Um, primarily focusing on um, weave constructed textiles um, and I think I would very much define myself as a designer who takes on these kind of um, this contemplative philosophy um, approach to investigating um, structure and color and uh, materiality um, in textiles and specifically depicting memory. Um, so I I take care of my work and try and create this conversation um, and this sense of awe um, through this kind of metaphor um, of memory intersecting into like the everyday life and how we can kind of um, embark on this kind of solace and um, capture this ephemeral quality that it might um, might consist of. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of um, relation to the topic in terms of the materials I use, linen and creating my own cordages from collected materials in my garden um, and also natural dyes and just the overall effect I like to create with my textiles being this kind of sensation and conversation through tactility and um, constructed woven textiles. Um, so yeah, I think my context is mainly based as a kind of design portfolio as of right now, um, but some pieces might be kind of um, developed as kind of um, textile art themselves and um, work into the kind of context of a gallery um, as well. Yeah, that's me. Thanks so much, Charlotte. Lena, let's, let's turn to you. So, Lena, if you could just unmute. Got it. <laughs> I did it. Um, sorry about that. So, my name is Lena. Um, I'm an artist and multidisciplinary designer, originally from Denmark, but I reside in London. Um, my background is in graphic design, um, corporate branding, and visual identity. So, the context of my current work um, is moving into this um, frame of expressing a personal narrative um, where I'm acknowledging the emotionally engaging process being equally valid to the systematic thinking of design that I'm so used to and comfortable with that's my safe zone and this ex expressing 
um, emotions um, is a new space for me to be in. Um, I'm currently working on the tension of, of that space of being in the in-between. Um, our human experience is full of this tension um, and being with that tension in that space of what appears to be these contradictions um, or opposites can be very transformative. Um, so conceptually, that is the inquiry of my work. Um, and it sits really well with becoming akin with nature um, because it's about being connected um, within oneself and understanding how that extends to um, feeling and being connected or disconnected from each other and our living environment. So through my work, um, as you can see on the screen in both concept and materials, I'm, I'm exploring how I can embody that, um, that sense of being. Um, what does it feel like when I have my hands in the materials? Um, and what does it look like? What shape does it take? And how can we have a conversation about this disconnect that I'm experiencing and that I, that I project is what is happening um, with our crises in the world? And can I give it a voice? Um, working with, with natural fibers and exploring um, biomaterials, again, that's what you're seeing on the screen right now, is, um, is my way of acknowledging um, the values of these materials um, and the consequences to our world when I choose not to use them in my work. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dina. Pat, let's come to you. Hi, yes, um, I'm Kat and I'm an artisanal maker. I specialize in one of a kind handmade textiles and wearables. Um, I connect philosophical thinking, slow craft and well-being. Um, I trained initially at the Glasgow School of Art in print design and I then spent several years working um, in the fashion industry and in luxury fashion. And it was really during this time that um, the shape, the narrative of my practice now was not all of my experiences, but for the most part, what I experienced was um, a very disrespectful handling of materials, but also of makers themselves. And I felt like I was becoming so out of sync with life and also myself and um, yeah, kind of working on multiple collections at once that weren't going to come out for years. And I don't know, I felt like I was on this treadmill of um, that was just getting faster and faster and I couldn't make it stop. And I was becoming further adrift from myself. And um, yeah, I took a period of time to kind of pause and try to realign. And I guess how Lena was speaking about um, using nature as a way to find a new connection with yourself. Um, I spent a lot of time just at my parents' allotment um, each day slowly weeding and just these kind of slow repetitive acts now speak a lot with the slow handmade process I use of hand stitch. Um, so now at the RCA I've really developed um, a practice that is about kind of intimately connecting with my materials. They're allowing me being patient and present. Um, <clears throat> and my current collection is all using living materials that I have either um, collected over time, locally foraged in small amounts, or um, grown myself on the allotment. Um, yeah. Thanks so much to all of you. I think. Um, each of us, of, of the speakers, has sort of had this sometimes you know, sort of painful chance to reflect on what it, what it feels like, what it means to be disconnected from nature and what it means to pull oneself back and, 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 and allow oneself to fall back with nature. But I was conscious when we were, we were talking the other day that we also each began when we were much, much younger um, with a very intimate sense of relationship to nature. I mean, so sort of certainly on my part, both, both of my parents are botanists, which kind of gave me, uh, gave me sort of unfair advantage at the start, but I have these memories of just lying out underneath a big tree in the sunshine and, and being dazzled by the light and dazzled by the leaves. And, and that being something which was such a strong sort of impression of what childhood was about. Um, would love to hear from each of you a little bit about your first recollections 
of nature, sort of what, what they were like, uh, what they meant to you. Um, perhaps, you know, Kat, why don't we come to you first on this one? Um, yeah, sure. Um, I think for me, one of my earliest memories probably isn't necessarily me being in nature. I'm very lucky that now my parents live in the countryside and that's such a kind of luxury and like a nice treat, um, retreat. But growing up, I lived in Birmingham and um, yeah, in a very densely populated area. So for me, this kind of um, memory of nature is more so in the home. Um, each week, my mum would go and buy herself fresh flowers and bring them into the house. And that was every Thursday, there was always fresh flowers in the house. And my mum's an incredibly selfless person, but this was the kind of a small, simple act that she always did just for her. And I was witnessing her care for nature as a kind of precious object and yeah, such a simple act that can bring you such joy and also beauty. Um, yeah, that's my memory, I think. I think I can um, follow off that as well as um, this sense of kind of just nature being a gift that's brought into the house. And for me, my, my memory is um, me giving this kind of natural gift of, um, as a child, I would run down my grandmother's garden. She had like rows of roses and um naively would just kind of pick the the top the head of the rose bud um with no kind of stalk so um it wouldn't last very long um but it was more this kind of I didn't know it was a rose I thought it was this kind of extreme kind of beautifully scented tactile um conceptual being I don't know I mean like as a child you just um, open to imagination and um, I would just bring it to her in my hands and gift it to her and um, she would be happy she wouldn't um, you know deny this kind of um, child naivety of not knowing to give it to them but um, it's this kind of attraction to just um, giving nature as a gift and the um, appreciation nature has and um, how abstract it can be as well and the beauty in that um, that's my memory. I think, um, yeah, those memories are quite similar. Those those haptic experiences of what nature feels like. Um, I think children in, in Denmark grow up um, predominantly outside in kindergartens. You spend most of your time outside in, in big, um, big suits. <laughs> um, so forest school is, is kind of a norm and the strongest memories I have of, of my childhood are these very strong haptic memories um, related to, to textures and colors and smells. Um, and I think everything in those early memories, it feels quite, um, quite close up. Um, there's this micro view um, with, this, with this sense attached um, and animals for me were present as well. And I think when you are close to their being, um, like you just said, uh, Charlotte, with the being of these these other creatures, um, and there's this this energy of these living creatures, and they're part of these memories, these energies, um, and their preciousness and the kinship you have to these um, living beings, whether they're animals um, in our natural world or if it's um, yeah, those are quite they're quite strong for me as well, and those are the ones that stand out in my memory. Um, and I think when you have these these memories that become sacred to you, um, and it now informs my sense of of care for my natural environment. There's there's a sacredness um, that I I feel like I'm responsible for now to to have um, or to care for. Yeah, it's interesting with these kind of like childhood memories that it's so we're so curious and we're so in awe of these materials and um yeah it's so visceral but then when when does that shift happen when we try to put it in this box and we become a controller of it or we forget that it's so precious because kind of like these externalities of day-to-day -day life come in and yeah we no longer just notice the kind of simple beauty that is just there all around us 
Yeah, I mean, that, that sort of maybe also is, 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 a, is, a, is a nice way of segueing sort of cat into this the sense of probably for all of us, and I, and I don't mean to insert myself into the conversation, but there's this thing of, of in a sense, straying or forgetting or losing that, you know, that, that ability of a, of a sort of a toddler to be fascinated by every single pebble on the path. We, we lose that at some stage where we're, we're, we're told it's a bad idea. But then there's coming back. And, and I'd love to, to hear from each of you about, as you think about your work now, you know, what from that childhood experience perhaps has influenced the way in which you um, engage with materials, the way in which you make your work? Um, um, uh, yeah, I can come in on that. Um, just, uh, just remember that I didn't say at the start, if anyone has any questions throughout, if they just want to pop them into the chat, we're going to have time for questions at the end. Um, sorry, I forgot to mention that. Um, yeah, so I guess how this kind of memory of my mother um, having these flowers in the house, I there is this really kind of bond with my work and the kind of maternal energy. And I think during periods of difficulty in my own life, I have seeked that um, kind of maternal role of the mother as carer and also found my own kind of um, relationship with Mother Earth and um, establishing my role as being a carer. Um, but also when my mom was bringing in these flowers each week, it was on a weekly basis that the flowers would bloom, but then they would die. And I was really understanding that this relationship between um, a precious object can't be, you can't hold on tightly to it. It's not gonna last forever, but that's also okay that it has such a kind of temporality. And I think that really speaks to the work I'm doing currently because all of the textiles I'm making are very temporary, they're living there. I have no idea how long they're gonna live for, but it is about me being present with them as they are, being present with the process and noticing they are precious right now, but not trying to hold on so tightly to that forever. I think drawing off that, I always say when I'm trying to like create this kind of um, feeling in my work and this sensation is kind of materializing the immaterial that this kind of memory or this connection um, towards nature or um, my, um, my experiences from childhood, um, they're, they're ephemeral, they're fragmented partly, some I can still really um, clearly remember, others have kind of, um, they've vanished or um, become more and more um, pale over time, but um, I think what still combines me to the nature and this kind of child intuition is this experimentation and um, intuitive thinking and um, being inquisitive and um, wanting to kind of feel the materials through my hands and make with them and obviously weaving itself. It's a very kind of engineering um, kind of exploratory process um, of, of working and a method, but um, yeah, it's bringing in these kind of sensations and trying to evoke a similar sense um, of materiality, I think, um, with nature, which my work has. And I think um, also my studio is outside um, and I can look into my garden. And it's, um, obviously, it's very kind of ethereal, this kind of situation that I have. But um, it really brings this connection um, to my work even stronger and makes it more prominent, I feel. Um, yeah. Mm. Um, I think it's beautiful how our language is is so similar. And you know, we speak when we're around the studio. But hearing both you and um, and Kat talking, and the vocabulary that we use, it's just um, you know, we could we could all be saying this the same thing. And I think that's that's the relationship um, that we have with nature. It's and it's these early impressions that I think give us that sense of, of, um, of our enjoyment um, and this basic attachment to, to natural materials. 
Um, and for me, that really informs um, a very strong sensory perception of what I enjoy to work with and have in my hands. But um, I also um, loved plastic beach balls um, and I'll sniff them when I'm in a store because, um, because it takes me back um, to summers spent by, by the sea. Um, but I'm reluctant now to choose those plastic materials um, because as a material designer, I'm informed of the detrimental effect um, of using those raw materials um, on our environment, um, both in the extraction, um, in the use of them and in the waste stream. So I think, you know, we're becoming informed, but it also means that we're starting to understand why I'm making those choices that I'm making and why those materials are important to me. And, and nature, for me, is still precious um, and it's sacred and it's alive. Um, for me, so that my my material choice is considered in terms of of impact that I may that I may cause um, on the natural environment as a designer, having a level of responsibility that I need to own. Um, and so, the way I work, um, the how I work, is probably very influenced by my my need to be actively involved with my hands and with my body, the physicality of it. Um, I think that resonates also with me in the sense of like um, the time as well that it takes to create things um, and with it being kind of your whole body in action. It's, I mean, like you, but also when I'm weaving, um, you know, you get into this kind of um, this flow, this motion of the pedals and shooting your shuttle and um when it's, it's the same as when you're kind of outdoors is trying to like re go back to this thing of just taking in um your surroundings and the stillness um against this kind of constant change and busyness that we surround ourselves and even in the studio um especially the last couple of days um but yeah I think it's even when I'm making it's a whole it's my whole body my whole hands I can feel it I can feel it within myself and um you know you smell the materials you 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 feel the texture and it's it's you're you're really connecting with with what you're working with yeah I think it's really funny isn't it that the textile industry is seen as um being one of the most destructive industries over nature which it is but as textile makers and designers we're the most connected to materials we feel them so intimately and yeah we kind of then get labeled under this but you're being so destructive um, but actually we have such a close connection to it but I think so maybe that sort of gives us sort of a, a sort of a bounce to a sort of a maybe a sort of a, a related question or we can pull back to the same one before but this is this thing of I think you know, for each of us, and certainly I think this is the case for me as well, that a big piece of my work you know, begins in walking. And it takes a fair amount of walking before my mind has reached the rhythm of my feet and I can begin to be anything at all. Yes, And then this luxury of time can feel very self-indulgent as well. And I think there's this question of, of how each of, each of you is thinking about how this work that is very much about understanding yourself and understanding your relationship with nature and finding a shared rhythm, finding a way of making that feels consonant with nature, how that moves beyond self um, and, and, and how, it, how it resonates in what, you know, there's this industry that, that sort of Kat has described as feeling so far from self, so very detached. I'll, I can start with that. Um, so sitting in this realm of both design and art, and having also been in industry for so long, I realized that the disconnect for me was sitting in front of a computer screen and having to be to pull on on these creative juices that weren't coming when you when you sit by the screen because I wasn't touching anything. Um, but from a designer's perspective, I believe we have much more agency to influence material choice, whether we work with it in hand or we make those choices based on whatever we create on in a digital realm. Um, and I think designers in general perceive themselves not to have this choice, um, but I think it's a matter of being the most knowledgeable person in the room when you're when you're sitting with a client um, and being able to offer alternative 
um, solutions based on what the client needs, what the world needs, um, what the market needs. Um, so in terms of my my artistic expression, you know, it's it's getting personal now. Um, and I'm working towards understanding what has caused this discrepancy, um, this disconnection between humans and, and everything else in our living world. And I know it started with me um, getting very active in my head and having to, to think my way through everything and strategize. Um, and there's nothing wrong with the design thinking in the systematic way. It's just there has to be harmony because the minute you pull yourself into that realm only, you are disconnecting with a much wiser um, sense of intelligence, a sense of beingness. And I think makers having to slow down and, and sit with materials and do the work um, in the fashion that you have to do the work with, with patience um, and becoming still, you're talking about walking, how can I, how can I get my mind to slow down by the pace by which I walk? You know, it's becoming attentive and observing of how you are with materials and what relationship you're developing with them. Um, so for me, it really, it starts within the disconnect, starts within ourselves. Yeah, I think um, even for myself, especially this MA, it really pushed this kind of open-mindedness and to reflect back on maybe personal experiences or really question what it was about that significance at the time that has um, guided me, supported me, or um, kind of underlying kind of message it had that it's drawn me to where I am today. Um, but I also try and draw upon this fact of collaboration and being open to work with others. And I think whenever you're open to start listening to other people's um way of working as well it really draws a different um a different realm of, of how you can work with one another and see your work from different angles and the whole pra whole practice of textiles or whatever you're making um from their point of view while still also keeping obviously your strong personal narrative um but when i when i go into do kind of community-led workshops it's really fascinating to see how um this um how children really still are open to exploring and playing with color and the colors don't necessarily match or the materials don't match but they don't mind they're just fascinated about almost kind of breaking these rules of what you're meant to do always at school and you're just kind of playing with dye and getting messy um and the older you go up kind of teaching or working with with uh, adults they sometimes can lose that a little bit and they find it very disorientating not having kind of this guided workshop sense of this is what I want you to do but I think once they embrace this kind of um, playfulness it definitely resonates somewhere inside of them back to this way of thinking and practice and in making and you know exploring materials nature and this instinctiveness Yeah, I think this idea of the self and self-indulgence is something I've battled quite a bit with. At the moment, my work is um, very much about my own personal healing. And I think for a while, I thought that to just be making work when I am at the core and it's just perhaps about my own healing is maybe selfish. But I think I've kind of come to understand that actually... The only truth I know is my own. The only thing I can speak on is my own experiences. And I can use that in a way that communicates with others something that they can too connect with because perhaps they haven't experienced the things I have, but perhaps everyone on some degree can connect with feeling disconnected or out of sync with life or um, feeling like things are running away from them and they're trying to gain some control and yeah at the moment my work is just really about me being very present with the here and now and so to think about what that looks like going forward for my practice um, taking it beyond the self is perhaps a bit of an unknown um, but I think 
my intent is just to really communicate to others the need to be present and to notice things around them and to slow down and I'm also whilst trying to communicate that trying to learn to do that myself um, but this idea that we can be on a journey of connection together whilst also doing it person on a personal level um, yeah, I think there's kind of an intimacy in both the collaborative experience, but also the intimate experience you have with yourself. Charlotte, I was just sort of thinking when you were talking about the, 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 the children and young people you were working with, um, I, I do a lot of stopping when I'm walking and kind of bending over and, and, and looking at very small things. And I realized how self-conscious I was about that, that I'd be thinking, is someone looking at me? And will they be thinking that I'm a silly old woman when I'm doing this? And in some ways, sort of the liberation of, well, no, I can do this. Um, and then sort of thinking, sort of, why is it we feel so embarrassed almost to, to engage closely with nature? Um, I think also context... it's this thing, sorry. Yeah, no, please. I was yeah. going to say, as textile designers, we notice the beauty in things that people maybe don't, I know like when I'm out foraging for stuff, I'll be um, like collecting something or looking at something and I'll have random like people say to me, oh, what are you going to do with that? Or like so bewildered almost that I can see um, a beauty in an object that maybe is slightly rotting or yeah, decomposing. Um, yeah, I guess it's quite interesting that we almost see unobserved things in. I think it's about place. kind of encouraging that, isn't it? It's yeah. encouraging that um, focus on taking time to look at materials or um, look at specific things and um, not care necessarily um, and really challenge that. Um, and there's such a sense of um, happiness that comes from that as well. I think when you start allowing yourself to do these things that may appear strange because you're thinking too much about it and you're too aware of, you know, you're so aware of what other people are thinking of you that you're losing that sense of connection with awareness of self. Um, and so we are living at the periphery of our experience as opposed to living within ourselves. And when you start to tune in to your own needs and your own sense of being with materials and your own sense of being with the world, you start to observe your world from a very different angle and you start to see the beauty in these small things. And it doesn't matter what anyone else thinks of how, you are, how you're down in the mosses looking for, for little, little things. Um, because that's at the, that's at the periphery now, you know, it's, and I think that sense of, exploring your your internal disconnect and what is it that makes what are these rules i've made up about how i'm supposed to live and and what i'm supposed to connect to and what i'm supposed to believe and and i think you know speaking of of intervening um in in systems the way they are i think they're based on rules that we have been taught to believe in like charlotte was saying about school kids are taught how to think about colors but what if you let children explore colors and see what kind of intelligence is coming through when they haven't been interfered with um, and that sense of of recognizing that there is a sense of beingness that isn't necessarily always being thought out but we're connected to something else and allowing that to speak through us and that beingness being being ever present everywhere and sensing into it and I again that comes through when people are making because you are slowing down and you are sitting with sensation as opposed to um, being in your head, you know, you're in your hands, you're feeling, you're touching. And that, again, I think creates a connection with yourself that you, that you then start projecting outwards. And when we give space, when we show other people what that looks like, we are, we are presenting another space to step into for others to also be in and to reside in and have that sense of connect within themselves. So you're starting to allow, like Charlotte said, you know, you have to start having that conversation so that you are allowing um, another way of being with materials, that digital isn't necessarily going to be, you know, a way forward, always. 
Maybe this is sort of a nice place to, to move to a sort of a related question, which is thinking about what nature itself um, can teach us about how we can inhabit the earth better. Um, it's, it's a good ethereal question, perhaps. Um, there's the sort of this, and, and I think, and, and, and it speaks to sort of a repositioning of ourselves vis-a-vis -vis nature from kind of a separate, perhaps imagining itself to be dominant being to a part of a system that has slowed enough to listen. There's a lovely um, Mary Oliver prose poem where she actually, she, she talks about why she only goes walking by, by herself or with people she loves very much because everyone chatters too much. But she ends up with this thing about slowing to the point where she can hear the almost unhearable sound of the roses singing. Um, so when the roses sing, what do we learn? Well, how can we learn from the roses singing? I think it's this thing that we need each other and we can't do this alone. And we can't be the controller of nature but also nature doesn't control us and there is a balance. Nature needs us to nurture it and in turn, it will nurture us too. Um, yeah, so I think this kind of need for each other. Um, yeah, I think that's what it is. I was going to say that a similar thing of this kind of side thought that nature has and um, of it being Ephem this ephemeral quality abstraction what you might call it but that it's not going to necessarily last forever and taking taking time to appreciate it the way it is now and taking time to appreciate it when it's not like it used to be when it is kind of um slowly dying or rotting away um and what one can take from that um but with this cycle it does need um, sun, water, the environment, and also sometimes things can happen which are unpredicted um, in, in nature where you're suddenly, you know, you have planted something in one space and something else will come up suddenly and you'll think, where did that come from? You know, it's, it's just, um, yeah, it's um, unpredictable, but um, it's part of this cycle. But I think there's that kind of um, element of forgiveness that runs alongside the unpredictability mm -hmm. because I know for me, when I was going up to the allotment each day, some days I didn't and some weeks I didn't. And, but then I would kind of go up and things were still there. Things were still blooming. So there's that thing of we're being destructed of nature, but it's still for now continuing and it forgives our wrongdoings. Yeah, that the, the cycles, I think, again, it's part of our vocabulary and, and recognizing how, um, how those natural cycles are also something that we live by um, and how this, this pushing and forcing cat, you spoke in the beginning of an industry that is seasons ahead you know they're not sinking in with the natural cycle of life right in this moment and so you're always living in this obscure reality of of not being in sync not with yourself not with the world around you not with nature and I think when we live in this or I feel when I am always in this push 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 mode um, when there's no rest when there is no settling um there's, there's obstruction to how I feel within myself and it's detrimental to ourselves and it's detrimental to how we treat our world because it, it's this, this, this idea that we can just continue to take and treat something poorly and it's just going to bounce back. So even though you're right, there is forgiveness to a certain point. Um, and then there is the you know we also break at some point if we continue to push against those natural cycles within ourselves and as women you know we have a natural cycle um that we also need to adjust to and i think we can be tuned into that um and recognize if we are observing and being with ourselves what do we need to do to to honor and respect and and hold that natural um cycle sacred within ourselves 
maybe just one last question and be before we go to questions from the audience, and that gives me sort of a chance just to encourage those who are listening in, if you do have questions, um, I see a couple have come in already, but, but please do share them with us in the chat. Um, I just wanted, wanted to maybe sort of come to a question we also talked a little bit about in yesterday's panel, which is these things that drive us, that empower us, that nurture us, that, that shape our work and the kind of work we're kind of doing, which we're trying to do, can feel luxurious, um, can feel selfish. The slowness feels like an absolute luxury at times. Um, how... How do you think about the accessibility of this? Sort of what, how, how, and and how in your own work are you thinking about sort of making that something which can be, be, be shared, can be enjoyed more widely? <laughs> I think again, it's this for me. It's the you know I I understand when looking at materiality and it's it's very luxurious to spend so much time with one thing. Um, but I don't know who said selfish. Um, I think this this honoring your need to work in a certain way and finding rest within that um, is again a sharing of this is another way of doing it. And we women don't have to continually push, push, push to, to lift these big tasks. No one does. Um, and I think when when you show that you are honoring that within yourself and you're being respectful to your own cycles, you are making that accessible to others that they also have that availability. And I know we're not all, you know, it's privileged to be able to sit down and spend a lot of time with one thing. Um, and not everyone has that, that luxury, um, but we all have an opportunity we have opportunities in our lives to connect within ourselves. Um, for me, it's it's through breath, it's through movement, it's through practices where, where I'm physically present. Um, and that's available to all of us to, to come and be with our senses. Um, and that's not a luxury, you know, that's, that's something we all are allowed to be with. Yeah, I think this um, conversation around accessibility of nature, of slowness, um, sorry. industry really has a lot to answer for in terms of that I think because um, there are industries like the well-being industry and the lifestyle industry that are selling these products that um, almost feels like a quick kind of fix or a, they're monetizing nature um, so this kind of like expensive skincare product or this essential oil that smells of lavender and it's going to make you feel calm and make you feel like you're in a field of lavender that makes it unachievable and unaccessible to everyone when actually everyone wants to feel well and feel calm and experience nature but actually the act of me growing lavender on my allotment is that all that needs is time and time is also something that isn't accessible to everyone I know that's also a privilege but this pack of lavender seeds costs less than a pound and I'm learning to nurture and care for it and watching it grow over time and these are all things that can be more accessible. Um, I think I'm drawing off that um, with the sense of um materials and um I've grown my own flax and um, gone foraging for nettles and it's the thing of that things can lie within kind of places in woods where you, you wouldn't usually go and you have to kind of get amongst them um but what you can retrieve out of um say a nettle itself but uh, the medicinal qualities the tea you can make um, paper with the, the inner of the stem and then you can make this yarn cordage as well as a fiber it has so many properties that I think otherwise just get you know brushed off and and overlooked and it's sometimes kind of going out and as we were saying kind of being more intuitive and looking closer at that weed which has kind of dug itself up um out of kind of a place where it wouldn't usually um be placed 
But it's also then yeah. this kind of accessibility of that knowledge, isn't it, Charlotte? And you were speaking about um, these community workshops you're doing. Yeah. And, yeah, really sharing that because, um, yeah, but you don't know all these medicinal qualities exist in these plants. But if we start to, um, yeah, really share this knowledge and share um, the kind of personal connection we create through doing these hand-based processes with others, that's something that, yeah, we can all connect with. I think, I think it's also that we often think of nature as, as this very big, wild thing far away. And yes, that is very hard to access for many. But I, I, I loved the work, for example, of the people who go around putting chalk circles around what I'm going to call wildflowers rather than weeds on city pavements and saying, look, look, look at this. This is what it's called. Isn't it beautiful? Um, and that this drawing and I've noticed that there's this, I mean, my, my own work sort of photographing lichens on, on walls and cities and things, there are things that are right there as well. And I think it comes back to this topic we were talking about a bit earlier, of just the, the permission to stop and notice that it's right there. Um, and that yes, for now it's persisting, um, but we'd better care for it a great deal better if it's going to. I'm going to pause us there and ask Kat um, what's coming up in the chat box in terms of questions for the panelists. Yeah, we have some questions coming in, so let's just have a look. Um, so we have one from Marie Therese. Would you like the college to do more to develop its relationship with nature? We have some green space and are fortunate to be opposite such a big London park. Do you have any innovative ideas as to how we could tap into this more? I think in, in general, we always, when there's like a sunset in the studio, we kind of are running to the windows to capture it and see it and um, appreciate it. Um, so I think maybe it's, I mean, obviously the, the college itself, you know, there's there's part of things that Lena and I are part of, um, Sustain Lab, which kind of employ this whole way of, way of thinking and appreciating and um, exploring, but, it's also just about ourselves appreciating the moment. And, um, you know, we can also just take ourselves on walk. We don't need to be told to go outside. Um, we choose to. Um, yeah, I think there is something in um, a lot of colleges and institutions are starting it with, um, for example, like their cafes or, um, they grow everything in house or have like allotments or greenhouses or these sorts of things. And so there feels like a more circularity, you know where the um, raw materials are coming from. So I think um, bringing in more initiatives like this um, could, yeah, could be good. Um, I also think the, uh, the academic structure that we were fortunate to be, be part of in terms of, of having to write a dissertation um, has um, given a, many of us a sense of agency because we've done research. Um, and I think that um, is a vital part of, of knowing um, the effect that we have as designers and artists on a natural world. And I think that I think that has been fundamental to at least my, my personal way of perceiving my role. Um, and, and how I use materials. And I think that needs to be part of the critical mindset that with which we work. Um, and that structure within the college has been very important, I think for many of us um, to have to go through. As makers, we're not likely to sit down and do a bunch of research, but we did. Um, and I think it's fed into to our um, to our sense of knowledge in a way that going forward, um, we're better equipped to, to be the most knowledgeable, knowledgeable person in the room in terms of materials, because we care about what we put into our hands. And now we know more about it too. Um, so another question, we've got one from Izzy. Does this unpredictable nature of nature mean your approach to working is more improvised or unplanned, allowing nature to guide what you create? Um, that's a lovely question. I can actually respond to that. Um, 
yeah, I feel like it definitely has an impact in that I never really plan a sample or a textile. I kind of start it with some sense of an idea, but then I let it kind of grow and evolve how I feel in that present moment. Um, and I think that kind of speaks to craft quite generally in that each piece is then um, very much one of a kind and you can't replicate it in its exact form, um, which again speaks to um, the kind of language and visuals of nature itself. I think also within my work, obviously weave is very, um, there's certain boundaries within kind of setting up for on, on your loom and there's some planning involved and kind of this technical side, but there's also this way of thinking how you can really challenge this loom, this, this um, equipment and um, do things which it isn't planned and, you know, working with weights and the materials that you put through the loom. Um, it's kind of completely... Um, putting the kind of rules that you've learned aside for this craft and kind of adding in your own. And I'm, I'm very much the same that I, to an extent, plan my samples in terms of how long I want the warp to be and how wide. But then when I'm sitting at the, the loom, I kind of occupy this thinking through making. And then whatever happens, I usually start painting on the warp or um, dyeing my, my um, threads afterwards and um, screen printing onto it or making my materials to go onto it rather than um, planning them extremely beforehand. Um, Which is this observing, right? You are observing what happens when you start to interact with, with your materials and, and you can set up a framework for how you intend to go forward. But then within that space, you, you maybe have to set your side self aside a little bit and say okay well now let the materials speak and when you're working with natural materials especially um, they're so unpredictable you don't know what's going to come through and can you accept what came through or are you going to try and force your own ideas about what that should look like um, onto whatever it is you're creating so it becomes a conversation that you have a choice to be present with or you can become forceful in your ways and, and go into really strategic ways of working where you know that the outcome is going to be exactly what you have in your head, um, which isn't being curious and it's not being explorative and it's not being um, experimental. That's just having a plan and sticking to it and having an outcome, um, which is very much how industry often works because there is, there's a tight deadline. Um, Again, I think, you know, it's a privilege that we can work this way here, but I think that the materials that we work with can also teach us other ways of process and how we go about developing our work. Um, yeah, we have a question from Alexandra. So interesting to hear about your insights and personal stories, the memories you shared when in touch with nature and nature's elements. With my question, I'm picking up uh, the title of a call for papers for a symposium about Stitches That Speak, Biography Through Objects. That sounds very interesting, which came to my mind during your conversation. To what extent would the following statement be true to you? That parts of your biography spoke through those, nat through those nature's objects you described, and might they continue to weave your biography in your practice today? or through new objects and materials that relate to those? I'm, I'm dyslexic and I can't hold that many words. I think it's, it's about this kind of, this, uh, this ephemeral, this fragmented, at least from what I can kind of decipher through that question is um, all my experiences kind of weave themselves into who I am as a being. And um, sometimes there is this kind of, um, if you're talking kind of metaphorically, this black thread, dark thread that comes into our life when, for whatever reason, um, but it's also the colours that we lay upon it and how we work through these experiences. Um, and I think that's why I have such a strong connection to weave as well, because it has this, this sense of, of memory relating to it. Um, 
but in kind of these natures of objects and how they've kind of come into my life is um I think I continue to explore new objects as well because they it's it's always kind of um being in awe of what I'm seeing in the moment but also wanting to be more inquisitive and see how um whether that object can be translated into making it into a yarn or um making it into a different biomaterial or even just you know taking the opportunity to to draw it through its kind of through its cycle um yeah it's a it's a interesting question as well yeah i think we all use our practices and textiles as a mode of storytelling and um yeah kind of weaving these stories and these relationships we have with nature through um an object and i think this actually reminds me of a conversation we were having lena about revealing and how much we want to reveal and how much we need to reveal and um yeah when we're doing that just through an object and there are no words attached to that even though these words and this shared language and the vocabulary is so important and integral how we can translate that just through the visual textile um and how that, that it's, it's interesting sort of how, how many of the words that we use in storytelling are words from textiles that we stitch together yeah, a mm-hmm. story, we we thread together a narrative, we weave a story. I mean, it's sort of this mm-hmm. uh, like textiles is sort of it's it's the joining together of the past and the present and the joining across space and time. It's sort of it's um, we 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 work in such an evocative area, don't we? I think we, we might have, Kat, do we, I think we might have one or two more questions and, and then yeah, we've got one wind ourselves question. towards a close. Um, yeah, so final question from Sam. You've all mentioned that your practice involves a lot of time. Do you see a future where textiles and craft are reintroduced as domestic practices, which are dom- dominant to industry, rather than craft influencing big industry and output? Yeah, I think actually also this, um, will become more predominant maybe now that people are really caring more about things being very localized. I guess also um, now that we're not part of the EU, I think this really means that a lot more production is happening um, in the UK again. um, I know they're looking into starting more kind of linen farms again and growing flax and that being kind of very localized. And I think this kind of shift away from um, kind of large scale industry production methods to, um, you know, kind of hand spinning and these, um, yeah, kind of more domestic crafts will be reintroduced and kind of revalued again. And I think then that will also shift um, the way we're consuming things and the way we're buying and um, this kind of, sustainable shift will influence um, a more sustainable way of thinking and a mindset for the consumer. Anyone else? I'm feeling a, feeling a pause here and also sort of a little bit conscious of the, the, the clock and we may have people who are needing to, to, to move on to other activities. What I'd like to, to do before we do that is give each of you a chance just to talk a little bit about um, where you're hoping um, your work might go next. Um, tell us a little bit about what's what's coming up. Um, happy for anyone to take the <laughs> take take the, the, the first first go at that. I'll begin like I, I did at the start then. <laughs> um, okay. I think. Um, I think my work is developing in a way that I can um, really build on this kind of material language that I've developed in this first term and develop it further more distinctively in my in towards the end of this MA um, and um, create this kind of openness and conversation of different people when they see my work and how um, whether there is this kind of um, philosophy of memory that exists in textiles and how we can kind of push this through craft um, materials, our identity, our narratives further. Um, I think I love talking to people about their work and as well how they experience my own work. 
And I think um, especially through the work in progress show, it offers a great opportunity to be able to do that and create insight. And um, yeah, I think also moving forward is collaboration and um, seeing the possibilities of my samples going kind of larger scale and outside of kind of um, maybe them being kind of single textiles um, and moving maybe into fashion or accessories. Thanks so much, Charlotte. Lina, how about you? Sorry. Um, can you say the question again, Sarah? I was just listening. Yeah, I was. Solution. A wee bit of background noise is a bit where, where I am now. Um, just, just a little bit about where you're hoping to go next with your work mm. um, over the next months as, as sort of sadly you move on from, from the Royal College. Yes, well, I'm, I'm not beyond the Royal College in my mind just yet. I feel like there has been such a, a, a pivot point in my work in the last couple of months um, of coming into this expression, um, this, this personal narrative that's becoming so important for me. And it's it's about finding that voice. Um, and an extension to that is, of course, recognizing that that voice is often um, not not allowed. It's obstructed um, by, by perceptions of what we are allowed to to talk about um, and some of the work that's the, or the work that's up in the studio for the whip show is um, is an expression of that and just allowing myself to complete that piece of work and engage with the physicality of it without saying too much about it um, I think again is is giving space to something that has to come through and something that needs to be talked about in a conversation that needs to be had. Um, and it's about developing this this fierce criticality of of what kind of voice are you bringing to the conversations within design and art about materials. But we've talked a lot about nature, but of course we all know that it's not just about the environment. It's also about the social impact it has on people. And I speak from the angle of of women um, because I feel like that voice has been um, squashed. <laughs> and I feel like, being able to use my own voice in order to say the things that I feel are important to say is also giving space and allowing that space for other women to feel like they can rise up and 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 speak as well about um, not just the beauty that they experience in in their work but also about the shadow sides um, of work whether we're talking art or design um, and and that conversation is becoming very important for me to have and also to listen to from others because we learn so much from each other when we share these stories. Yeah, Thanks I think so much, I feel, Lena. Kat, yeah, let's come to you. Um, I think I feel very similarly to Lena that we're both very much in the depths of a very kind of personal work and personal place at the moment that um, there is still that somewhat unknown of, of um, the kind of path beyond the RCA. But I think coming from um, a very fashion focused period and experiences, I'm yeah, enjoying just playing around with seeing my work speak to other areas and um, be recognised in other spaces. And I think it's been quite recent that I've started to weave well-being and um, yeah, other other conversations into my work. That um, yeah, I think that kind of is unknown, and I'm enjoying that it can organically evolve to the place it should be. Thank you all very much. I think it now has left to me both to thank the panel, thank Kat for her wonderful organization and thank all of the panelists for sharing so much of themselves and their work with us today. Thanks also to everyone who came along um, and asked questions um, and listened. Um, as Kat mentioned, this has been recorded, so we'll go up um, on the RCA YouTube and, and do watch our, our Instagram space on this. There will be the third and final panel tomorrow, um, which is on traditional techniques and innovative possibilities. It's in the studio. It's a live one, and um, both wonderfully and sadly, it's a sold-out event. Um, but we will be recording that, so those of you who haven't been able to sign up for a space, you will be able to watch it later on. And then finally, for those um, who are here with us who have not spent the last two days on the seventh floor of the Darwin Building at the Kensington campus of the RCA putting their work up, do come and see um, 
the absolutely beautiful and amazing work, both of the colleagues you've met today and tomorrow and of the entire textiles family. We're open from 12 till six tomorrow and 12 till nine on Saturday. Thank you all so much. I um, look forward to seeing some of you tomorrow and look forward to seeing you in the studio. Thank you, Penelope. Yeah, thank you so much. And thank you for all the questions and for those that attended.